it is not long now until we're going to have a fully operational James Webb Space Telescope, or JWST, that will start working through science observations for the 286 successful projects that were proposed. The alignment is now complete for all of the instruments or detectors on board that will actually uh, record the light that the telescope collects. And now the team are going to move on to all the calibration and final check stage that should be finished by around about June 2022, at which point it then can start looking at all of these science targets. And while I am excited for all of the observations that JWST will do. I figured I'd make a list of the five targets I'm looking forward to seeing the results that we get from the most. These are in no particular order, and I'm sure that none of my astrophysics colleagues will 100% agree with me on this list, just because there are so many exciting things that JWST is going to look at. But let's dive in anyway. First up, TRAPPIST-1. This is a system of seven exoplanets in orbit around a star that is much cooler and smaller than the Sun, about 39 light years away in the direction of the constellation Aquarius. The planets orbit much further in than the planets do in the solar system, with all seven of them fitting inside the orbit of Mercury. But because their star is much cooler than the Sun, it means that four of them still lie within the habitable zone, or the Goldilocks zone, where conditions on those planets are thought to be not too hot, not too cold, for life as we know it, at least. And this is why we want to observe it with JWST, specifically with Neospec, which takes the light from an object and splits it into its component wavelengths, so we can see how much of each different colour or wavelength of light there is there. The proposal that was put in to observe TRAPPIST-1 is headed up by Olivia Lim from the University of Montreal. And what they're trying to do is isolate the starlight that passes through each planet's atmosphere in order to work out which wavelengths or colours of light get absorbed by specific elements or molecules present in their atmosphere. For example, a water molecule, H2O, absorbs light with a wavelength of 2.7 microns in the infrared range that JWST is sensitive to. What that means is that if we make a trace of the amount of light of each color or wavelength that we detect with JWST, if there's carbon dioxide or water or ozone present in a planet's atmosphere, it'll leave a gap or a dip in that trace of light that we'll make. And we'll know that perhaps this planet in the habitable zone might have the ingredients that we know that life here needs to thrive, and then we'd be one step closer to knowing whether we truly are alone in the universe. Number two, GNZ11 and HD1. These are both candidates for the most distant galaxy we know of, the light from them having left when the universe was less than 500 million years old. So GNZ11 was sort of the top candidate for the most distant galaxy known for a very long time, before HD1 has literally just knocked it off the top spot in 2022. I actually covered this in my most recent Night Sky News video, if you want to check that out and hear all about how we actually go about even finding these galaxies in the first place. But what we haven't been able to do yet is confirm that they're at the distance that we think they are. The Hubble Space Telescope has been able to take an image of both of them, but the light is far too faint for there to be enough of it for Hubble to collect and split it through a prism and get a spectrum so that we can know how much has the light been redshifted as it's travelled through the expanding universe, therefore how far has it travelled, therefore how distant are those galaxies. But we can do this with JWST, I mean it's been designed to do exactly this, you know, some of the light from the most distant galaxies has been redshifted so much that it's no longer in the visible wavelengths that we can see with our eyes or the Hubble Space Telescope can detect. It's actually been redshifted so much it's in the infrared, which is why you need JWST. And it means that it can detect the light from not just the most distant galaxies, but it's also the, the oldest light that's been traveling for the longest through the universe as well. And it gives us a glimpse of what galaxies were like billions of years ago, in the very early days of the universe, when galaxies were literally just forming. Number three is Irundel. This is the most distant single star known. It's not a star in our own Milky Way galaxy, which is the majority of all stars that we can see. This is in a galaxy at an incredible distance, but its light was spotted by the Hubble Space Telescope, thanks to a chance alignment of the this distant galaxy that this star is in, and a cluster of galaxies that was in the foreground, which acted like a huge lens, bending and magnifying things in the background like the bottom of a stemmed wine glass does with the light from a candle. 
Again though, because the light from this star and this lensed galaxy that it's in is so faint, it was too faint for the Hubble Space Telescope to get a spectrum. A, to confirm that it was actually at the distance that we thought it was, and B, that this thing is a single star and not just like maybe a cluster of stars. Again though, this is what the James Webb Space Telescope has been designed to do. So this study is led by Dan Coe at the Space Telescope Science Institute of Baltimore. And they plan to take both an infrared image with the near cam detector, you know, just to get sort of like that high resolution in the infrared that they want of that uh, lensed galaxy. And then they also plan to take a spectrum with the near spec detector as well, again, to get at, you know, how far away is this thing and what actually is it? all with the hope of better understanding, you know, what were the first stars that formed in the universe actually like? What were they made of? Were they made of pristine hydrogen? How old actually is this star? And what can it teach us? Number four, the Cosmos Fields and CR7, Cosmic Redshift 7. The Cosmos Field is a two degree square area of sky that has been observed across X-ray, UV, optical, infrared, radio wavelengths, collecting as much light as possible to see fainter things. There have been over 400 scientific papers written using the Cosmos data that already exists, the likes of, you know, the Hubble Space Telescope that's looked at this area of sky as well, all with the goal of better understanding galaxy evolution how do galaxies change and evolve over their lifetimes? And looking in the different wavelengths tells you different things about what the stars are doing, what the black hole is doing. The same patch of sky is also due to be observed by JWST, adding to this rich variety of these detailed observations across the different wavelengths of light. What JWST will add to this is allowing you to see where the dust is in galaxies, where it's radiating, but also at different wavelengths, see through the dust as well to what's going on beyond in those galaxies, but then also see the most distant galaxies in this field too, the kind of which, you know, the light has been redshifted so much that Hubble can't even pick them out anymore, but JWST can in the infrared. The Cosmos Web Project, as it's known, is headed up by Dr. Jehan Kartaltepe at Rochester Institute of Technology and Professor Caitlin Casey from the University of Texas at Austin. There's also another 49 astronomers across the world that are also involved in this project. They plan to use both near cam to look at the near infrared wavelengths and MIRI to look at the far infrared wavelengths to image the cosmos fields with three main science goals that you can see here in the proposal. That I'll also link below all these proposals free to read. But what I'm most excited about is an object called Cosmic Redshift 7 or CR7 that was first discovered in the cosmos field. So it's also covered by Cosmos Web. And what it is, it's a very strange object that we can't explain. It has this weird spectrum, so there's this trace of light that we don't know what's causing it. And there's a couple of different explanations, but some of the most exciting ones are either hypothetical population three stars, they're hypothetical because we've never observed them, but we think they must exist because essentially what they would be is the very first stars in the universe to have ever formed out of pristine hydrogen gas, you know, that's not been polluted yet by later generations of stars going supernova and throwing out the heavier elements that they've made in fusion out into the universe. Or the other option, again, a hypothetical direct collapse black hole. Essentially a gas cloud that's gonna skip collapsing down into, you know, hundreds of stars and instead collapse straight down into a black hole that's maybe a thousand, ten thousand times the mass of the sun. Because the thing is, we don't actually know where the supermassive black holes that we find in the center of every single galaxy we see in the universe around us, how do they actually get there? It's like the astrophysics equivalent of the chicken or the egg. Did the galaxy come first or the black hole come first, right? So like, did a collection of stars that you could call a galaxy in the early universe form, one of them goes supernova, become a black hole, and then that started to grow, became the heaviest thing, and therefore everything sort of like rearranged around it, or, did a cloud of gas in the early universe collapse straight down into a much bigger black hole and then the galaxy of stars form around that? We still don't know which one is actually the case or whether maybe both could happen, but Cosmos Redshift 7, CR7, is possibly the best candidate we have for maybe being a direct collapse black hole. So I'm really excited to see what JWST and the Cosmos Web project reveals. And finally, the center of our own galaxy, the Milky Way. Now we have long studied the center of the Milky Way with infrared telescopes to be able to see past all the dust, the stars orbiting around the center and measure the mass of the thing that they're orbiting around. Andrea Gez's group at UCLA have been doing this with the Keck telescopes on Mount Akea for decades. And they use that data to show that there is a supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way that is four million times the mass of the sun. 
That work actually won Andrea Getz a Nobel Prize in Physics back in 2020. I actually made a video on that at the time with all the history behind it if you want to check that out. One of the successful proposals for JWST in its first year is headed up by Dr. Jessica Ryan Liu at Berkeley along with the rest of Andrea Getz's UCLA team and they plan to use NearCam on JWST to image the centre of the Milky Way at greater resolution than we could ever achieve with the Keck telescopes on the ground. This increased resolution will allow them to do much more precise tests of the gravity in that region around the supermassive black hole so that they can ask questions like, is there perhaps like a, a collection of smaller black holes in orbit clustered around the edge of the supermassive black hole? And also ask questions like, okay, the stars that are in orbit around that black hole, are did, did they form there? And if they did form there, well, how did they manage to form there in, in such extreme gravity? Or did they form somewhere else and end up there? And if so, where else did they form? It's amazing that JWST will allow us to do such precise observations so that we actually have a hope of answering questions like this hopefully very soon. Alright, there you have it, my list of the top five targets for the James Webb Space Telescope JWST. Now I'm not one to start wishing my life away, but I cannot wait for this summer when JWST starts taking observations, you know, and we start getting data down, my colleagues start doing a lot of the analysis that they've uh, proposed to use JWST for, and then we slowly but surely start seeing, you know, some of the, the first astrophysics research papers getting published and all of these answers trickling through, answers to some of the biggest questions that we have in astrophysics. Before we get to the bloopers, a huge thank you to Brilliant for sponsoring this week's video. Brilliant's an online STEM learning platform that gets you to learn by doing. They have courses across a huge range of topics, you know, science, maths, computer science, that are interactive to help you really get to grips with a concept. Plus, they're fun too. You can learn on the go and at your own pace. Plus, there's lengthier explanations to help if you ever get stuck as well. Now, one question I get asked all the time is, what do I need to do to become an astrophysicist like you? And I always respond by saying, the one thing you can do to make everything easier is to practice maths until it becomes second nature, like a second language to you. And Brilliant's new Everyday Maths course is perfect to practice those skills, you know, with everyday concepts so the context is familiar, even if the maths maybe isn't yet. So if that sounds like fun, head to brilliant.org forward slash Dr. Becky, or you can click on the link in the video description down below and sign up completely for free. Plus the first 200 of you that go to that link will get 20% off an annual premium subscription. So thank you so much to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. And now, roll those bloopers. I haven't got any jewellery on. Oh, bugger. No. Right now. Right now! Oh god, yeah, we went back first. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Comedy of errors this morning. Comedy of error. For example, a water molecule, H2O, will absorb light at a wavelength of 2.7 micrometers in the infrared regime that JWST is sensitive to. Hell no, H2O! Hell no, H2O! <laughs> all I can think of whenever I say H2O. I've got this song in my head that's like from Encanto when she's like introducing the family and they're like, but what about Mirabelle? And I keep singing, but what about Arendelle? But then I have no idea like the rap lyrics that come next. I'm just like, but what about Arendelle? Andrew Getz actually won a Nobel Prize in physics back in 2020, for that 2020, <laughs> too many 20s. But it means that four of them still lie within the habitable zone or the Goldilocks zone where the conditions would be not too hot and too cold for light. Should I say not too hot but and too cold? <laughs> it's like British people describing British weather. It's not too hot but it's too cold. 